Hi, and welcome to another episode of Rob's Triathlon Tips for Beginners. Another sort of health-related video here, like my videos on blood pressure on and on uh, calories and why they're nonsense. So here's my disclaimer again. I'm not a doctor. This is not medical advice. <laughs> it's only edutainment that hopefully yeah, you learn some things from, and maybe you go and do some of your own research, and then consult a doctor if you feel the need to. So let's dive into my notes. Um, one of my favorite things to be asked when I say to people that I eat a high fat, low carbohydrate diet is, aren't you worried about your cholesterol? And people that ask that question are asking it because what they know about cholesterol is wrong. It's really that simple. Now, when people think of cholesterol, what they're thinking about is their lipid blood work which is numbers on their LDL, HDL and triglyceride levels. Okay, those aren't cholesterol. Those are like markers of cholesterol in your body. So to call them cholesterol is part of the confusion that everybody has. Uh, cholesterol is something that exists all throughout your body. You don't have a hope in hell of measuring all the cholesterol on your body, basically. So we measure LDL and HDL and triglycerides as markers to sort of give some insight into what's going on in your body. About 85% of the cholesterol in your body is made by your liver, and the other 15% comes from the food that you eat. And then whatever uh, cholesterol that isn't used by a body from what you eat comes out the other end of you as poo. Um, and cholesterol plays a crucial role in the health of your cell membranes and many of your body's hormones. People don't know that. Uh, for example, cholesterol is the mother hormone of testosterone and then all estrogen in the body starts out as testosterone. So estrogen comes from cholesterol too. Um, so you can see how, understanding that, if you eat a diet that is very low in fat, that you will muck up your sex hormones. And that's why you have people like Durian Ryder on YouTube who talks about how great eating a low fat diet is. And then at this, in the same breath says that every year he has to go on testosterone therapy because it makes him feel better. <laughs> I mean, good on him for being so transparent, but the diet he's eating is causing his problem. Uh, cholesterol, believe it or not, is metabolized into um, vitamin D and also bile acids. But, but how does it, how does that relate to vitamin D? Cholesterol is modified by your body and stored in your skin. And I'm just, I'm skipping a whole bunch of details here. I'm just covering this at a high level. And exposure to UV rays from the sun causes the cholesterol to be modified again and go back to the liver and your kidneys where it's converted into vitamin D. So bearing all of that in mind, cholesterol is not a bad thing. So when someone asks you if you're worried about your cholesterol, that's obviously a flawed question. They're not, they're not asking the right question. Are you worried about your LDL, HDL, and triglycerides is a, is a better question. But as we'll go through information, you'll discover that that's also a dumb question if you're eating a low carbohydrate diet. So triglycerides are a form of energy in your body. If you're worried about your cholesterol in terms of triglycerides, that's also kind of a dumb thing to worry about because triglycerides, they come from you eating fat. Your body breaks down the fat and then it mixes uh, a triglyceride or a glycerol molecule with fatty acids in a ratio of three to one. And that's what a triglyceride is. And it's used for energy in your body. And you also get triglycerides from eating more carbs than your body can deal with and stores glycogen. 
So triglycerides are not a bad thing either. LDL and HDL are lipoproteins. So that they stand for low density lipoprotein and high density lipoprotein. You can think of them like almost like a bubble soccer ball that you see people running around in and bouncing off each other. Think of them like that. And um, when your body makes triglycerides, LDL and, cho and cholesterol, your LDL is produced by the liver to transport the newly made cholesterol and triglycerides to receptor sites throughout the body where they'll be used for energy or for um, cell cell plasticity I think I forgot to mention that that's what one of the things cholesterol does is make sure your cells membranes are healthy and give them plasticity uh, and HDL travels the other way it goes to receptor sites and it takes old cholesterol back to the liver to be repurposed and recycled so LDL and HDL are not bad uh, they're both serve a purpose in your body and to say that LDL is the bad cholesterol is wrong it's just absolutely wrong <laughs> There's another lipoprotein that most people don't know about called VLDL, very low density lipoprotein. And I'll talk more about that later in this video when I go over some theories about why you get plaque in your arteries and atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. So how does a typical doctor diagnose and treat you? One of the funniest descriptions that I've heard about most doctors is that they do what's called paint by numbers you probably remember that from when you're a kid it's you know everywhere where it says number one is red and number two is blue you, you get the point so <laughs> the doctors follow guidelines and they don't think for themselves is what that um, metaphor is saying basically <laughs> a typical uninformed doctor that's just following guidelines will tell you that you have a cholesterol problem by following two overly simplistic trains of thought number one you have high LDL so you have a problem number two they'll add your LDL your HDL and your triglyceride numbers together to get a total cholesterol and they'll look at a chart and tell you you have a problem <laughs> now let's deal with number two first because that's easier to explain why that's nonsense and it's not just me saying that you can find lots of cardiologists endocrinologists who say the same thing that total cholesterol is junk science you can dis discredit that idea just by looking at a single study there's a study in I believe it was in South Korea and followed 12.8 million people for over a decade and tracked their blood work and mortality rates and at the end of the study they published this chart and on the y-axis uh, mortality rate and on the x-axis total cholesterol and total cholesterol ranged from 115 to about 300 and the people with a score of 300 were eight times less likely to die than the people with a score of 115. So total cholesterol means absolutely nothing in terms of what's happening in your body. It's garbage science. So let's dive into LDL and why you can't just point at that number and tell you you have a problem. So problem number one with LDL blood work is it's typically a calculated, estimated number. Because the test to give you a real number is a more difficult test to carry out. It's not because it's you know, prohibitively expensive or something. It's, it just takes more effort on the part of the lab. So they estimate your LDL based on other parameters. There's a, there's a formula. And the person who created that formula 
that's used to calculate your LDL listed all the conditions for that formula being accurate. And one of those conditions is that the formula assumes that people are metabolically healthy, which most people are not. The latest estimate that I heard is that 93% of Americans are not metabolically healthy. So that formula to calculate your LDL is useless. It is inaccurate. Problem number two with your LDL blood work. Your LDL may vary as much as 15% from one day to the next. <laughs> Problem number three. A lot of people are not honest when they're told to fast for a certain period of time before their blood work, and that throws off the results. Problem number four. If and some studies have compared the sort of associated risks of different factors, uh, and, and what they found was that if you have elevated LDL, you will be about 30% more likely to get uh, cardiovascular disease than someone who doesn't. Okay, so that is significant. It sounds significant. But then what you won't be told by your doctor is if you have elevated triglycerides, you will be about 80% more likely to get heart disease than someone who doesn't. That sounds a lot worse. And one study found that about 50% of people who had a heart attack did not have high LDL. So like saying that that was a factor, that they had an elevated risk because their LDL was <laughs> higher, was completely uh, discredited by that study. It had no correlation whatsoever in that study. So I don't know how much trust you want to put in that 30% number, basically, based on what that other study said. So why do your, why does your doctor um, focus so much on LDL? And the answer is simple. It's because there have been drugs to treat LDL, artificially lowering your LDL levels for decades, since 1987, I believe, specifically. And only very recently have drugs to lower triglyceride levels been developed, but they have a lot of side effects, so most doctors doctors aren't prescribing them to patients. Problem number five with your LDL blood work, as if it wasn't bad enough, the triglyceride levels are a much bigger concern and people are treated for that. Insulin resistance is the number one correlated risk for, for cardiovascular disease identified in multiple studies. The studies that compare LDL against insulin resistance found that insulin resistance is five to six times stronger of a marker of cardiovascular disease risk. That even blows triglycerides out of the water as, a, as an associated risk. And almost all people that have a heart attack have insulin resistance. Let that sink in. So what does a typical doctor prescribe to you? They prescribe statins. There are different brand names, but they're all statins. It's this type of drug. And they're the most widely prescribed drug in the world, from what I understand, about two to three hundred million people worldwide are taking a statin. And they, what they do is they artificially lower your LDL by reducing the amount of LDL that your liver makes. Now think about that in the most basic sense. Your LDL transports your cholesterol which your body needs to where it's needed. So the medical answer um, for your health to reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease <laughs> is that you should artificially reduce the amount of cholesterol that your body can, can get to be healthy. Instead of figuring out what's making your LDL damage the walls of your arteries. And like, that's bafflingly stupid. You're forcing your liver to do, to not do what it does naturally. 
So just like how type 2 diabetes is treated by managing a symptom, which is blood glucose, instead of the root cause, the preventative treatment that's used in most cases for cardiovascular disease ignores the root cause. And we'll dive into what the root cause may be in a little bit. A common side effect of taking a statin is reduced testosterone. Why? Because, as we discussed previously, cholesterol is where you get testosterone from. Another possible side effect is muscle pain and even muscle damage. I mean, gee, I wonder why that's happening if your cells aren't getting the cholesterol that they need to have a healthy plasticity. Maybe that's a bad idea. In some cases, people get severe tissue damage and protein and electrolytes can be released in, into the blood. And those substances can damage the heart and the kidneys and cause permanent disability and even death. It's a condition called uh, rhabdomyolysis or rhabdo for short, R-H. A B D O. <laughs> Speaking of your kidneys, statins can increase your risk of kidney disease. Another potential side effect of taking a statin is liver damage. Again, that's weird. Forcing your liver to not do what it wants to do naturally is a bad idea. Weird. <laughs> Don't forget, you could potentially get tendinopathy and tendon ruptures. Last but not least, taking a statin can give you type 2 diabetes. Now remember, type 2 diabetes is caused by insulin resistance is a leading factor in the development of cardiovascular disease. But just in case you don't have type 2 diabetes yet, we're going to prescribe this drug to fix your LDL and potentially give you type 2 diabetes which is going to put you at risk of cardiovascular disease. <laughs> is, this, is this sounding stupid? Because it should. You're probably thinking, okay, but how much does a statin reduce my risk of dying prematurely from heart disease? I need to take that into account before I decide whether I should take this drug. Uh, you need to understand that your doctor will probably quote you something like this. Uh, statins have a relative risk reduction of approximately 36%. And if you're not paying attention to what they said, you're going to miss out on the key word in that sentence. Relative. Relative risk reduction is a statistical trick to inflate the effectiveness of something. The absolute risk reduction of taking a statin is what you need to know and that's anywhere from one to two percent depending on what study you look at and what product they're testing okay let's just say for an example it's 1.3 percent so I'm just these are just some made-up numbers to, to prove how ridiculous relative risk can be so let's say you have an LDL that's less than 150% and this study says uh, you have a 0.3% death rate from heart disease. In other words, 99.7% survival rate if your LDL is less than 150. And if your LDL is over 290, you have a 1.3% death rate from heart disease. In other words, 98.7% survival. So there's a difference of 1% absolute risk in people who have a higher LDL in, in terms of those numbers, right? Now, what you can do is you can take 1.3 and divide it by 0.3 and you get 4.13. And then you can say there, there is a greater than 400% relative risk increase in cardiovascular disease and death if you have higher LDL. That sounds pretty scary, but it's BS. It's a manipulation, a statistical lie. It's not the absolute risk increase. 
Um, some more information that makes you think that statins might be not the greatest thing to take. According to one study, the average life extension you can expect from taking a statin is three days if you have not had a heart attack yet. Five days if you've had a heart attack before. So is taking a statin a good risk reward bet? No, it's pathetic. It's probably gonna mess up your health and not do anything to prevent you from dying prematurely. <laughs> taking a statin uh, basically puts money in the pockets of the pharmaceutical companies and in some countries your doctor is going to get a financial kickback too by prescribing it to you that's what's going on that's why you're going to get prescribed that drug not because you need it not because it does a lot not because it focuses on the greatest risk for you having cardiovascular disease because there's money to be made on you taking this drug so how does a decent doctor diagnose people nowadays a decent doctor that's more up to date on the latest research that isn't painting by numbers that actually uses their brain starts by looking at your HDL to triglyceride ratio because they know that that's a far better indicator of your metabolic health than your LDL by itself and that your triglyceride levels put you at a higher associated risk than your LDL levels. Now let's say you have high HDL and high and low HDL and and high triglycerides in your lipid blood work. Why are your triglyceride levels high? You get triglycerides from eating fat and too many carbs, as I said before. But is it the carbs or the fat that's causing your triglyceride problem? Just think about that. Uh, and you know, your typical doctor will say, reduce the amount of fat that you eat. Uh, and that doesn't fix your problem. And you inevitably end up on an LDL drug and, and a statin. And that ignores your triglycerides and your insulin resistance. What happens to people who go from a typical diet to eating low carbohydrate? That should shed light on whether it's carbs or fat creating your problem with triglycerides. So people who'd make that switch typically have high HDL, the good kind, slightly elevated LDL, and low triglycerides. And they reverse their insulin resistance. So you know that it wasn't the fat causing the HDL and the triglyceride issues in your lipid blood work. The triglyceride levels track with VLDL that I briefly mentioned before, and they're driven to be in excess by consuming too many carbohydrates. Why in someone on a low carbohydrate diet would their LDL number still be a little elevated or really high? Why is that? And why should that not be a concern, right? So people who adopt a low carbohydrate diet more than likely heed the advice uh, to remove industrial seed oils from their diet and what do i mean by that they're called vegetable oils but they're all made from seeds and they're made in industrial plants and they're disgusting and they cause all kind of inflammation in your body and they were originally used in the automotive industry <laughs> And I could keep going forever about how horrible they are for your diet. It's something for you to look into if you're if you're curious, but they're disgusting. To get them out of your diet. Um, they're called heart healthy, but they're the exact opposite. Those oils are high in what's called plant sterols. And so if you don't get prescribed a statin, you could get prescribed plant sterols to help with your cholesterol. And plant sterols limit they don't limit your ldl production they limit how much cholesterol is made by your body which we know is a stupid idea right because your body needs cholesterol and if your body makes less cholesterol 
it's going to make less LDL to transport the cholesterol, theoretically, right? So if you remove a big concentration of plant sterols from your diet when you go low carb, is that a problem that your LDL goes up? Or is it your body returning to LDL levels that it would have had it not been suppressed? Think about that. Also remember that the equation that's used to calculate LDL levels, if you cut carbohydrates out of your diet, it invalidates the equation. That's another one of the conditions for that equation being valid. So, just a little interesting side tidbit. People with higher LDL have a much lower correlated risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. The brain is made up of a whole bunch of fat. Both of those problems, Alzheimer's and dementia, are now being referred to as insulin resistance in the brain, also known as type 3 diabetes. In other words, they are metabolic disorders. And fat and cholesterol appear to be protective of the brain. So what are some of the theories about the cause of cardiovascular disease? Uh, there's a theory that uh, cardiovascular disease um, can be impacted by the size of your LDL particles. So you can have large buoyant LDL particles and then small dense LDL particles. Theoretically, the small dense ones are what damages your arteries and gets stuck in the walls of your arteries and cause plaque to build up, also known as atherosclerosis, leading to cardiovascular disease. Right? Uh, and you can order lab work called an advanced lipid panel that will give you insight into the average size of your LDL, which would be useful, but most doctors generally don't do that. Why is that? A lot of them don't have any idea how to interpret the data from those tests. It's not that, again, it's not that it's expensive to order these tests. They're like 50 to $200 according to one cardiologist whose video I watched in the United States. And uh, so you could pay for that yourself if you had to, if your insurance didn't cover it. But then you have to find someone who can interpret the data or educate yourself on it on the internet to see if you got a problem. Uh, there's a cardiologist who's famous recently for um, relating to the pandemic uh, named Dr. Asim Malhotra. And he's done some research that indicates that excessive carbohydrate consumption is what drives the development of small dense LDL. And that large LDL, the buoyant kind, that doesn't hurt you comes primarily from fat. I've also read that trans fats may cause the small dense LDL as well. Also related to carbohydrates, there's a concept of glycation where glucose in the blood can in essence alter the, the structure, the, the exterior of LDL and HDL making them less recognizable to the receptor sites that they're supposed to go to. So theoretically your body wouldn't be able to recycle old cholesterol as well as it wants to and or get new cholesterol to cells as well as it wants to in that case. Uh, one theory is that your HDL, if your HDL is high and your triglycerides are low, then your LDL level is theoretically meaningless because you should be metabolically healthy if your blood work looks like that. And the average size of your LDL will almost certainly be large, the supposedly non-damaging LDL. Conversely, if your HDL is, is low and your triglycerides are high, your LDL being high is an indication that you have more of the small dense particle LDL in theory, and you're more likely to have insulin resistance as well. And in that case, you would have all three associated risk factors for cardiovascular disease. 
high LDL, high triglycerides, and insulin resistance. Translation, you'd be a ticking time bomb. So some people hypothesize that VLDL is the reason that people are getting cardiovascular disease. Uh, consuming high amounts of carbohydrates cause high levels of VLDL and triglycerides. And VLDL particles apparently like to interact with LDL and HDL and transfer some of the triglycerides to them, making them more dense. And apparently HDL that's enriched with triglycerides is, is less protective um, against cardiovascular disease. I mean, are all so are all these theories better than the overly simplistic theory that LDL is bad, so you need to reduce your fat intake and take a drug for the rest of your life? Hell yes, they're better than that medical laziness. That's what it is. It's BS. The problem with these theories, though, uh, if you think about the the things that I've said and you watch that a few times. Uh, is that not one of them addresses why things are getting stuck in your arteries. That, in my opinion, is the root cause. And everything else is a contributing factor to you getting cardiovascular disease faster. So what damages the walls of your arteries? That's the question that people should be asking and paying attention to, in my opinion. Well, for one thing, glycation does. There's glycation again. But not everybody who has a heart attack has high blood sugar, in other words, type 2 diabetes. Almost everyone who has a heart attack has insulin resistance, which leads to type 2 diabetes. And you can find an article on sciencedaily.com called, Your Arteries May Be Suffering Insulin Resistance Too. I encourage you to go and find that article and it's very short and then there's a, a, a reference to a report from 2020 from 2010 and at a high level what, what really stands out to me are these following two paragraphs insulin resistance and blood vessels insulin resistant blood vessels don't open up as well and levels of a protein known as VCAM-1 go up in them too. VCAM-1 belongs to a family of adhesion molecules. It sits in the endothelium and binds white blood cells. Those cells can enter the artery wall where they start taking up cholesterol and early plaque is born. That sure as hell sounds like a root cause to me. Because if there isn't some reason why things are getting stuck in your arteries, then all this other theorizing about VLDL and small dense LDL and everything else would be meaningless. All of these different particles would just be flowing through your arteries, no problem not sticking to your walls. But this sure sounds like the root cause. Insulin resistance is causing things to stick to you, the walls of your arteries. That's my opinion anyway. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to talk about in this video, um, which is just as ridiculous as people saying, aren't you worried about your cholesterol because you're eating a high fat diet, is people who are afraid of saturated fat. It's maybe a little more explainable why they're afraid, afraid of that. There's some history to that, so I'll go through that. I mean, but the first thing that I want to mention is that um, right from the moment that you're born into this world, you are consuming saturated fat. When, and why is that? It's because your mother's milk, breast milk, is about 54% saturated fat. So it's in your nature to consume saturated fat from the beginning of your life. And even more ridiculous and evidence of human beings being stupid, the formula that kids get felt, fed when mothers you know, choose not to breastfeed or they, they're not successful at it, 
um, it contains that that formula contains no saturated fat because we're so bloody smart that we know better than nature. Now, why was saturated fat made the villain in the past? In the 1950s, people were concerned that the rates of heart disease had been going up like crazy for a few decades, and they needed to point the finger at something as the cause. And doctors at the time were saying it was because more and more people were smoking. And we know now that those doctors were correct. Smokers are two to four times more likely to get heart disease based on different studies. So that's definitely a, an important factor. Um, but at the time, the tobacco industry was very powerful and deflected the blame. And there was also a lot of research at the time that said sugar was to blame. And the sugar industry was also a pretty powerful industry at the time. And big tobacco and big sugar funded researchers to put the blame on something else. Fat. And here comes uh, a character that is, a, you know, in retrospect, did horrible things horrible damage to the health of millions, if not billions of people as a result of their work. Dr. Ansel Keys. He's the most famous person that did research that said that saturated fat was to blame for increase in cardiovascular disease. His study from 1958 uh, was called, called the Seven Nation Study. It's famous. People love to quote it. And uh, people have since combed through the raw data from his work and proved he cherry-picked data to draw a conclusion that he wanted. He had a bias going into the study, and he picked data to confirm his bias. And the medical community ran with his nonsense, the Seven Nations study, ever since. You know, like 60 years. And the number one issue with his study is correlation does not prove causation. Issue number two. People have found out in retrospect that Dr. Ansel Keys had data for 23 nations. And if you plot the data from all 23 nations, there isn't even a vague correlation between saturated fat and cardiovascular disease. The data is scattered all over the map. There's no correlation. Issue number three. It's since been proven that he was paid by the sugar industry. So he had a huge conflict of interest. This is not conspiracy. It, it, it's downright fraudulent what this guy did. It made fat the enemy for, for decades. And it spawned a new processed food industry, making food that's low in saturated fat, high in carbs, and high in industrially produced seed oils. And people all around the world have done nothing but get sicker and sicker ever since. It's like a diagonal line. It was definitely not the fat making people sick. Apparently anyone at the time, before the internet, obviously, that, was, uh, that opposed Dr. K Dr. Keyes was academically bullied by him, backed by the sugar industry, of course. This is documented. It was, so you couldn't, you, can't, you couldn't fight back in real time back then. There was no internet. Um, you might be thinking, okay, but why would a reputable doctor do something like that? To, to put some salt into the wound of what he did to humanity, he had a degree in economics and a PhD in fish physiology. He's not even a medical doctor. He wasn't an endocrinologist or a cardiologist or anything like that. He did stupid things like reference a study as supporting evidence where rabbits were fed meat and developed clogged arteries as though it would prove anything about human beings being, uh, <laughs> right? Rabbits are herbivore species. They don't eat meat. Of course they're going to get clogged arteries if they eat meat. Their bodies are completely different than ours, right? You have to consider a species, dogs that are given carbs and, and cats that are given carbs develop health problems just like human beings. In nature, dogs and cats are carnivores. If you feed them carbs, they get sick. And I can go into this more in another video, but human beings ate mostly meat, 
for a couple million years at least. This is proven scientifically, it's irrefutable. So we are built to eat meat. We have high stomach acid and a single stomach, just like all carnivores on the face of the earth. Anyway, what, what other studies have been done that proved that, even re more recently, that proved that Ansel Keys was just fraudulent? So there is something called a, the Women's Health Initiative. It was one of the largest studies ever done and one of the most expensive studies ever done, coming in around $700 million. And the study was several hundreds of pages long. And nothing declared in the results table is of statistical significance. In other words, even if there seems to be a correlation, if there are if there are other variables and factors that you can't really you can't really place any any uh, like weight on that thing the only statistically significant thing in the report which people have found by combing through it which was left out of the results table and buried on page 600 and something was that for women with a history of heart disease if they randomized those women in a control group for low fat diets, they had an increase in cardiac events of 26%. So there was an inverse relationship between fat consumption and cardiac events. That should be front page news, but it's not. The body of evidence to support that there's nothing wrong with eating saturated fat is now so big that medical entities throughout the world are slowly adjusting their previous dietary recommendations to allow more and more saturated fat to be consumed in the recommended diet because they know it's nonsense. They have to do it slowly and carefully and not announce it to the world that they've been wrong for all these years and that it's contributed to people being sick. Can you imagine the lawsuits? Um, what what studies what other studies have shown that saturated fat is not a health concern uh, the studies that are carried out basically by independent entities those are the ones not the ones funded by the food industry that sells you the food that makes you sick and the big pharmaceutical companies that benefit from having lifelong customers that are sick that sounds like a conspiracy theory until you start digging into details like the FDA getting about 50% of their funding from user fees from companies that need the FDA to approve their drugs and medical devices. And the other half of their funding is mostly from the government. But remember, the food and drug industry is allowed to lobby Congress and senators. And the head of the FDA is nominated in the United States by the president and voted on by the Senate. And the head of the FDA brings in a board of directors from the industry that typically serve a short period of time, make sure that things happen that benefit their industry, and then they go back to where they used to work. It's a revolving door. It's a revolving door. It's crooked. There's no conflict of interest there at all, is there? And the rest of the world tends to follow suit with what the U.S. does. And if you're from Canada... Um, if you're curious, about 30% of the funding for Health Canada comes from private industry. Uh, so why haven't I talked about the Mediterranean diet, for example? Uh, who came up with that, with what's known as the Mediterranean diet? Maybe you've guessed it. It's the same jackass, Dr. Ansel Keys. <laughs> what He looked at what people eat on the island of Crete and decided that because they eat a lot of olive oil and fish that it, and it must be higher in, in must be the higher amount of unsaturated fat that they eat that is why they have lower cholesterol so he fashioned what people call the Mediterranean diet leaving out all the other food that they eat on that diet which is a lot of protein with saturated fat so you can see how researchers can cherry pick whatever data they want that suits them and misleads the public. And his, his Mediterranean diet is not the true Mediterranean diet. He, he staked his career 
on saturated fat being bad and did whatever he had to do to reinforce that idea. Some other interesting statistics. France has much less incidence of heart disease than most countries and they get about 40% of their calories from fat, 15% from saturated fat. Then you have remote tribes of people like the Maasai in Tanzania, the Arctic Inuit in the Aboriginal tribes of Australia who consume more than 60% of their calories from fat, mostly saturated fat. And they have the lowest rates of heart disease. And the last thing I want to mention is that studies that do a head-to-head -head comparison of low-fat, high-carb, Mediterranean, and high-fat, low-carb diets show the following. Low-fat diets perform the worst in improving HDL, LDL, and triglyceride levels. Mediterranean diet does the next best, and the high-fat, low-carb diets do the best job of improving your lipid blood work. You may have to watch this video uh, multiple more times <laughs> to really absorb everything, but um, uh, hopefully you found it to be entertaining and you learned some things and maybe you go and do some of your own research. Um, and if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, make sure you're subscribed to my channel and share the video with people who may benefit from it. Thanks.